of necessity is there's fewer hairs to cut every day. <laughs> well, it looks good on you, Thank I you. think. Thank and you. I, I appreciate that. And she got her uh, second shot yesterday. Oh, 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 well, that's nice. Children are 24-7. Yeah, so I got my Thursday and Friday. Yeah. That's right. And he, so that makes fever, you feel a little better. Yeah. But he does. Chills. I just very chill. I am. Just achy and tired. Yeah. She was sick the next yeah. week, but she never got so I'm glad you'll be tested. Yeah. Yeah. She tested one time yeah. negative. When I tested yeah. positive, that, she uh, got tested and tested negative. But the next week, they said, was, I asked him how long she never tested. She never tested. She never tested. She never tested. So you had a very mild case. You had a fever. I wasn't even going to get tested, but my daughter was going to get tested. Tested positive. And the weird thing is, my brother. Exactly. Oh, I think I just have a cold. Yeah, that's what I said. Because they first had to talk to your mom before she left. Uh, uh, I said, that's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I think I have a cold. Go get tested. Go get tested. Yeah. Yep, I got it. Well, as soon as I are. I didn't know that. It was a bird kind of snow. Yeah, you're 92. I'm not dying to show you. Yeah, you're 92. I'm not dying to show you. That's cold. We'll call it that. Yeah.
Good morning, and welcome to First Congregational Church of Webster Groves. For those of you who have joined us in person today, welcome to worship at First Congregational Church. Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter and the first Sunday of the month, which means that we'll be celebrating the sacrament of Christ's table. For those of you joining at home, I encourage you to prepare a serving of bread and a cup for your own use when we get to that point later in the service. I'm your announcer, Herb Niemeyer, and I'm joined in worship today by Cliff Airy, who's in for Pastor Dave, who was admitted to Missouri Baptist Hospital with chest pain and was kept overnight. But they have diagnosed that it's musculoskeletal pain, and he'll be discharged later today with anti-inflammatory drugs, so. But Dave's, yeah. And Dave's joining us from his room. So he gets the experience we've all had for a long time. I'm joined also by Cliff Harry, who's presenting the sermon today, pastoral assistant Hallie Kim, and student pastors, pastors Merriman Boyd and Elston McGowan. I'm losing my place. Also, we have our music director, Leon Burke, the f and our audiovisual technician, Mark Metcalf. It's also my pleasure to welcome back our chancel choir, our handbell choir, the Canterbury Bells, and add to them our hospitality team, the First Friends, our acolyte, and tower bell ringer, and the volunteers assisting with the audiovisual equipment. Whew. Thanks to all those who are making our worship today possible. This worship service includes spoken responses and songs to sing. You're encouraged to download a copy of this morning's bulletin document from our website, First Church wg.org. To prepare for worship, I invite you to center yourself by closing your eyes, greeting God's spirit wherever you may be. Next, take a deep breath. Exhale. Now I invite you to join me responsively in our call to worship. O oh, sing to the Holy One a new song. Our God has done marvelous things. Sing praises to God with the lyre and the song of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Let the waters clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy. Oh, sing to the Holy One a new song. Our God has done marvelous things.
Good morning. morning. Look at me, I almost ripped it all off. I'm on camera too. So, if you saw me over there, I was texting Dave and he said he he was getting excited. I said, listen, don't get too excited. (laughs) So, we've been in prayer for him. He don't know this, but I'm his friend. (laughs) So, I come to you with a prayer of approach. Oh God, we sing songs to praise you, songs like that of which we never expected to sing. You have rejoiced our hearts, and we know that only in you can our joy be made complete. Teach us your commandments more completely so that we may truly and faithfully abide in you. For we have so often failed to live up to the possibilities you have created for us. We have sometimes been dismissive of you, ignorant about you, and we suspect that we may have missed the fullness of our joy. Forgive us and direct us anew, as you have promised to. In the name of Christ, our guide and brother. Amen. Hi. It's so fun to have people here. Also, I brought my notes with me because I'm also nervous. I'm excited and nervous, so here we go. Um, So, kids, you've probably heard grown-ups talk about loving God. It's kind of weird, right? Like, what does that mean? We all have our own ideas about God. You might think of God as a dad or a mom or a best friend. You might not know what you think about God because it's hard to connect to something that you can't see or hear or touch. You might wonder what God even is or if God is real. I ask those questions. But it helps me to think about love and God as the same thing. The Bible says that everyone who loves knows God and everyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So no one has ever seen God, but when we see love, I think that's seeing God. And when we love each other, that's God in us. You know what I really love about kids? Kids love so easily and so big. When my kids meet other kids at a playground, they're friends in like three seconds. Grown-ups make this way too complicated. And when my kids make cards for me, they don't usually write just, I love you. They write, I love you so, 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 so much. My kids are overflowing with love, and I know all the kids here are overflowing with love. This one time, Jesus told some grown-ups that they needed to be more like kids. And I think it's because Jesus knew that Kids understand love better than grown-ups, which also means you guys understand God better than grown-ups. So it's completely okay to be confused about loving God and what that means, because it's weird. But this might help. When you are full of love, you're full of God. So when you share a toy with your brother or you help your sister, or you make friends with a new kid at school, or you hug someone who feels sad, that's God in you. Love is God. God is love. Let's pray. God, thank you for kids who teach us how to love. May we listen to them and follow their example. Amen. So now I want to invite all the kids here, kindergarten through high school, to follow me out those doors over there.
It is so beautiful to see our youth back in church. I don't know about you, but I just want to give them a warm <laughs> round of applause. Thank you, parents, for coming out. I want to direct your attention to our shared word this morning. It's coming from 1 John, the epistle, chapter 4, and I will be reading verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent the only begotten into the world so that we might live through that child. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent that child to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us. And God's love is perfected in us. From the Gospels, John 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus said, I am the vine and my Abba is the vine grower who removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit is pruned to make it bear more fruit. For you have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whosoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch that withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Abba, is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. Well, I don't know about you, but this does seem a little strange, does it not? After more than a year of worshiping virtually, we're actually together in the same place at the same time. Well, true, we might be sitting a little bit further apart. We may be wearing masks, some of which are very colorful, but yet it's different, and yet it's the same, isn't it? You, you don't forget it. It's, it's a part of you, this thing called worship, is it not? And here we are. Now, the irony of all this, of course, is that the one person who has worked so hard this past year, so hard to make worship come alive through cyberspace and the virtual reality, enduring <laughs> difficulty, obstacles, one after another, and who is looking so much to being here today, to actually be in person, to share the word, is not here. And so our prayers go out to Pastor Dave 
and uh, hoping for his speedy recovery, which it sounds like he's well on his way to. Now, when Dave called me yesterday and asked if I would preach, he said, uh, the scripture lessons are from John and 1 John. And I was planning on using a quote by the writer Barbara Brown Taylor. What is saving you today? That's her question. What is saving you today? So let's pause just for a moment. Take some quiet. Ponder that question and join in prayer. Almighty, wondrous God, ruler of all creation, we gather here now. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, you know, I think I've read just about every one of Barbara Brown Taylor's books. If you haven't read her, you should. She's a prolific author, she's down to earth, and she wrestles with a lot of issues and ideas that I think that you will find simpatico. This particular quote comes from um, a response that she received. She was invited to preach at a church, and beforehand she, she talked to the ruling elder to get some insight onto what the congregation really needed to hear from her. And he said, you know, we don't need to hear any of that theological stuff. What we need to hear is, what is saving you now? That's just kind of a strange question, isn't it? Now, our, our, our evangelical sisters and brothers tend to focus on the question, are you saved? Have any of you ever been <clears throat> lovingly accosted by an evangelical who wants to know, are you saved? And when? And where? And the exact minute and how that has transformed your life completely. I've not had that kind of experience. But I think I've had the kind of experience where I can truly speak to what is saving me now. If you go to um, John, and, and we heard it this morning, Merriman, that was a beautiful reading. Thank you for sharing God's word for us today in, in such a clear, concise, and enthusiastic way. God is love. And if God is love, God loves us, gives us that love. Ought we not to love one another? And then that last line, God's love is perfected in us. Um... No challenges there, are there? But God's love is perfected in us. So when this elder was speaking to Barbara Brown Taylor, he wasn't asking for a time, a place, an event. He was kind of saying, so what is it that fills your life with, with passion and meaning and substance and God's love. And this, of course, is a fluid kind of thing. It's not just one time. It's throughout our entire lives that we are filled with God's love, which means, and you know, you know, Hallie just preached such a beautiful sermon. She said it clearly and concisely. I, I almost want to just sit down and say amen to what she said. So, for us, if we are to embody God's love, if we are to share it, if we are to live our lives, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that saves us now? What is it that gives meaning and purpose and becomes, for us, if you will, a safety net? 
So I know you're all waiting for a story, which of course is the typical way when I'm with you that I share some things. So let me share a story. And this story dates back <clears throat> 50 years ago when I was a very young man. And I would share with you, as I may have before, that I did not grow up in the church. I had no experience of Christian fellowship or what the church was like. And I didn't join a church until I was 21. Now, during those early 20s, within three years, I had two of the most significant people in my lives die tragically. And the first was my father. And I had no bearing, no understanding of God, Jesus, or what any of that meant. And I was devastated. My life simply fell apart. I had no hope. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. There was nothing to hold on to. I didn't have any, any sense, uh, you know, other than my family. And our family was not always the closest of individuals. And so I was kind of a sea, a drift. It wasn't until I met a special someone who took me to her church, brought me through the door, introduced me to church family, brought me into the worshiping life of a church, got me on the road of this thing called Christianity, learning about what Christianity is, and then with that, in a sense, beginning, beginning the journey of faith formation, of understanding what does it mean to live as a Christian. Tragically, this person died as well. And again, my life was thrown into chaos. Well, yes, I now had a, a faith, a belief in God, but was I any more safe? I felt just as adrift, just as devastated. And it was only through the love and compassion of my pastor at that time who encouraged me to go back to college. So here's where the story really begins. I went from New Jersey all the way to the wilderness of Pella, Iowa. Central College, a small Reformed Church college in the middle of the cornfields. And there, if I were to look back and name it, there were two things that saved me then. One was the campus church where I found a group of students and faculty and, and the chaplain in an environment that was, was able to reach out to me and sustain me. And the second was the college's jazz band. Of course, you know me. Those two things, the Christian fellowship of the campus church and the jazz band. And so it was only a matter of time before I approached the chaplain and said, we need a jazz worship service. And he said, well, yes. Why don't you gather a group of students and plan one? Okay, I said, I will. And so I gathered a group of not only musicians, but artists and creative people to help me formulate a worship service for the chapel. We worked for about three or four weeks putting together and coming to an understanding of liturgy and the different ways in which we could bring the arts and creativity into the worship. And so we were going to use the music of a jazz quintet. We had a poet. We had some dancers. We had um, a, a movie that we were going to show. Um, we were going to incorporate a vast array of the arts into worship. The day before the service, we spent several hours going through the liturgy and putting all the pieces together so that each one flowed into the next seamlessly. We were ready. We were sight. We were hot. We were going to do this worship service the next morning, and we were going to rock the place. Next morning, we get there, and we start the prelude. Now, I don't even remember what we played all those years ago, but it didn't quite click. The energy just wasn't there at that particular time. 
And our solos, well, you know, they could have been a lot better. But, you know, surely we, you know, we, we've, we've practiced this. We know what's going on. Things are going to get better, right? Uh-uh. The Call to Worship was a short movie. Now, remember, this was before uh, uh, VHS and DVD. So we were projecting a movie, took off the soundtrack, and the jazz group played to the movie. Well, we weren't more than 30 seconds into the movie when the projector spit out the film. And so we had to keep jamming while they were putting the film back in the sprockets and putting it back together and finally putting it back to the beginning and playing it through again. It was a long call to worship. Well, then during the course of the worship, our poet read his two poems out of sequence at the wrong time. And since we were improvising with him, that led to some train wrecks along the way. We had some actors who were going to create a skit for the sermon. Uh, they forgot their lines. And then we had dancers who were going to lead the, the congregation in body prayer. One of them stumbled and fell flat on the floor. Uh, they recovered, and they kept on going, but it was like the rhythm was, was broken. And, you know, the, the, the band, well, we played all the music for the hymns and the service music. But again, it was either too slow or it was too fast. It was just, and I remember at the end of the service, all I wanted to do was put my horn in the case, close it, and leave the back door. Well, there were a number of folks afterwards who gave very appreciative comments of the service, but I knew that it was a failure. So I went back to my dorm room, and all that afternoon I relived what had happened, how what I had created, what I had planned, what I had led, what was to be my moment in the spotlight had all imploded, came crashing down. It was a disaster. The next morning, I met with the chaplain, Jim Van Hoven, at the college uh, cafeteria, uh, the commons. We sat down, and Jim said, well, Cliff, how do you think the service went yesterday? Well, I spewed forth in great detail all the things that went wrong and how it was a complete, utter failure, that everything that I had done, I had planned, I worked on, I put together so that we could do this, just failed. And Jim just sat there for a moment in silence, and then uh, he leaned back and he lit his pipe because that's what, you know, all the, you know, the, 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 the campus chaplains, you know, they always smoked a pipe back then. And then he said, Cliff, I have two observations. The first is that it was not your service. Oh, ouch. It was not my service. He said, it is so hard to get rid of your ego as a worship leader. Your job is to be a catalyst to enable others to worship. And the minute you put all your ego into this, you are not going to be one of the worshipers. And then he leaned forward. And he said, that's my first observation. Here is my second. And I tell you this in great confidence. I am counseling with a student who's having a difficult time in her life. She came to me yesterday afternoon and said that when she had awoken that morning, she was so despairing that she was determined to take her life, to commit suicide, something she'd been talking about for a long time. So she decided to take one last walk around the campus before she did the deed. She walked past the chapel and heard the jazz music and went inside and sat down in a pew. She told me that it was the first time in her life that she was ever able to have a sense of hope the music, the dancing prayer, the poetry, everything had worked together to show her that her life had meaning and purpose, and she was not 
going to take her life. So Jim said to me, Cliff, it's not your worship. It's the love that you share through the worship. And in doing so, you give something to somebody else, something that could even save their life. So what is saving your life now? What is it that fills you with such joy, enthusiasm, passion, meaning, and purpose, love, that you can take that and share it with others? And maybe even amidst those times in your life where you feel that you've faltered or failed, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're not only saving your own life, you're saving the life of another. Let us pray. Oh, God, fill us with your love. Fill us with your joy, mercy, compassion, so that we may be bearers, perfecters of that love through Jesus Christ to show what it means to be fully alive, grateful, and loving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Consider how much becomes possible for us when we reside in God's love. This love is not comfortable simply being in us, but causes us to reach out to one another and beyond ourselves into the world to bring positive change and blessing. Combining material gifts, we are able to extend the love of our community into communities all over the world. For the present time, until it's safe again to pass plates or collect in person, we'll be receiving offerings only in the plate in the narthex on Sundays in person or else by mail or online. If you're able to financially and you would like to support First Church with a monetary donation, please send a check to First Congregational Church 10 West Lockwood Avenue, Webster Groves, Missouri, 63119. Or go to our website, firstchurchwg.org, and to our donate page. Thank you. To dedicate our offerings and ourselves, let us raise together the covenant of our church. We who are called of God into this Christian community covenant together to seek to know the will of God, to experience the joy and struggle of discipleship, to proclaim in word and deed the love of Christ, and to work for peace and justice among all people. We trust God's promise of grace and forgiveness and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our trials and rejoicing.
praying for renewal and redemption. We come believing that we can be fed here by the gracious hand of God, aware of an unquenchable thirst for peace and for justice. We reach for the cup of God's love and life. We come to this table in the confidence that God will meet us here and that we will be nourished in righteousness and faith. These things we share are for all who desire to abide in Christ so that Christ may abide in them as God abides in us. Mm -hmm. That is one grand and open desire. So ours is an open table. Before we begin our ritual, let us be mindful of those who are not with us this morning and for whom we are praying. What prayers uh, do you all have? Normally we have folks, we write down something and give it to uh, the folk and they bring it up and then we pray. But because we're not passing paper because of the virus, uh, we're asking for you just to make an announcement if you want to stand and share with us. In fact, I have a microphone and I'll be glad to come to you if you have a particular prayer that you want us to want to share with us. Guys, I scan this way. Okay, I'm gonna I'm hold it. Okay, I'm let you hold it. I want to thank for everybody putting their prayers in. I can't scope. I don't have a computer, and thank God. Mm. Thank but uh, I'm doing well. Had my truck finally fixed and passed. And to thank all the people that were there to help me out. Amen. So in addition to those and other prayers uh, listed in our bulletin, we ask that you also uh, pray for Jim Bennett. Now, rumor had it Jim might show up with us today. So if Jim is here, wait for me. But Jim, he's in the hospital, so I would be surprised to see him, but that would have been a great surprise. Uh, as well as his uh, daughter, Beth Bennett. Uh, she, wants, she wants to share that... Uh, she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, so we encourage you to keep her in uh, your prayers as well. And certainly, last but not least, our pastor, Dave Deneau. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'd like for you to focus on the Sersum Corda. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Most High God. Gratitude, praise, hearts lifted high, voices full of joy. These you desire, O God, for when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name and no faith and no future, you called us your children. When we lost our way or turned away, you, you did not abandon us. When we came back to you, your arms opened wide in welcome. And look, you prepared a table for us, offering not just bread, not just wine, but your very self, so that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, blessed, and made new again. You are worth all our pain and all of our praise. So we join the song of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy, holy, holy God put our prosperity at the service of the poor. We cannot bring the fruit of the vine and forgive those who are thirsty. The ground and the roots, rootless, the earth and its irritable craft. 
God, put our fullness at the service of the empty. We cannot hear your word of peace and forget the world and war. Or, if not war, then prepare for it. Show us quickly, God, how to turn weapons into welcome signs and the lust for power into a desire for peace. We cannot celebrate the feast of your family and forget the church's division. We are one in spirit, but in fact, history and hurts still dismember. God, heal your church in every brokenness. Let us pray as Christ our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Among friends gathered around this table, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body. It is broken for you. So I invite you also. have to do the choir, right? Mm
<laughs> yes, me too. Wouldn't happen if Dave was here. Among the Rams, gathered around this table, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, it is broken for you. So I'm going to do also. Take the time to run and feel back. Later he, mm -hmm. And later he took the cup and said, this is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. Take this, all of you, and I invite you to pull the little silver part out. And he said, take it and drink all of it. Wow, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've never seen this much. My fingers are getting some work out. All right. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. everyone wasn't, wasn't that beautiful with us I loved it <laughs> next month we'll loosen those tabs <laughs> 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 they know I like to play but he got me this time <laughs> we give you thanks gracious, gracious God that you come, come to us, us in bread and cup, and in the love of this gathered community. Now, now send us forth from this people, nourished and empowered people, your disciples, to live your love, speak your peace, and sing hope. Amen. Go now, for you have been fed, you have shared the living bread, you have been grafted to the vine, you have tasted heaven's new wine. Go now, you have been blessed, Jesus calls you each a guest. God knows your name and says you're wanted. And in your lives, God's seed is planted. Go now and go in Christ's own peace, and in your own going, do not cease. To love yourself, you are God's treasure, and love the world, it is God's pleasure. And love your God in greatest measure. Amen.
Whoa. Thank you, Leon. That's our worship for this week at First Church. We're glad you could worship with us. Those of you at home, there will be a virtual coffee fellowship today at 11 on Zoom. The virtual coffee fellowship link is on our homepage on the website. Those of you worshiping today here in the sanctuary, please plan to exit this space at the indication of an usher and meet next in the Jubilee Garden at the south end of the east parking lot. Our worship next Sunday will celebrate Mother's Day. If you would like to attend in person, please go to our website for instructions about attending. Or if you subscribe to our e-newsletter, the instructions are there also. Worship will also be live streamed to our YouTube channel. So if you're not quite ready to be in the sanctuary yet, please plan to meet us there. One more page. Our worship has ended, let our service begin. For those of you here, Jackie Bryant has made a bunch of masks, permanent masks, she's a great artisan. They're in a basket back in the narthex. So there's the, Bob's holding them up now. So our worship has ended, let our service begin. And try to find a place safe for the extra grape juice. <laughs>